Thank you for all your patience. Clanet is India's largest live digital CME and doctors generated medical content platform. Our website is www.clanet.com, where we have lots of live sessions conducted by the eminent speakers across the globe. And we have MedWiki services also, which is medical Wikipedia for the doctors only. That also you can read in your leisure time. We will invite all the doctors to visit our website. Now, without further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Anjali Pinjal, ma'am. Over to you. Kindly proceed. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our first session. And uh, to inaugurate the session, I would like to call upon Dr. Sohan Solanki, our secretary. Over to you, sir. Yeah. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Sohan Solanki, and on behalf of SOPSI Nestal, I welcome this first webinar of weekly lecture series like uh, this start by SOPSI. So we have taken this uh, academic initiative, keeping in mind the increasing burden of cancer in India and increasing number of anesthetists opting for the super specialty in oncology anesthesia. And we have uh, now uh, this SOPSI, this fellowship running in six hospitals across India, and many more hospitals are uh, also up for this fellowship. So we hope that you will get benefited by this initiative and uh, you will all enjoy the academics. So, and uh, and today we have Dr. Kiran Mahindru from the, the DMC at Ludhiana for a talk. So I give this um, uh, <clears throat> mic again, again to Nila and Pingle and he will, she will introduce Dr. Uh, she will speak and she will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, good uh, so good evening again. And uh, as Sohan has already said, we started this uh, fellowship uh, program as a part of our initiative to uh, inaugurate the Onco Anesthesia branch as an upcoming branch. And uh, we want to support all of the centers uh, which are running the fellowship program, whether for SOPSI or for DNB Anesthesia. So this is, a pro uh, this is the intention behind starting this teaching session. And uh, the initial bit is where we're going to uh, have the faculty of various teaching institutes uh, taking lectures for our fellows. And uh, there will be some experts who will be speaking on certain uh, topics. And eventually, we'll widen the program to include everybody. So everybody who's interested will get an opportunity. And we're going to see how the response is uh, to this program. And accordingly, we may vary the duration or the frequency of the sessions that we hold. So with this in mind, we're going to start with the first session. It's very brave of Dr. Kiran to volunteer for this. Dr. Kiran Mahindru is an assistant professor at uh, Ludhiana. And uh, she's done her MD from Walana Azad and she's done her DM Onco Anesthesia from Ames, New Delhi. Over to you, Dr. Kiran. She also has a palliative care fellowship. Over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the kind introduction. So I'll start with the presentation. So, uh, good evening, everyone. So, uh, as Sir has rightly said, that the burden of cancer is increasing, and so is the need of surgical interventions in these patients. So, as an anesthesiologist, we should be very well versed with the effects of chemotherapy and radiotherapy in these patients. So, uh, we know that the major modalities of cancer treatment basically include surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. and in low to middle, middle, uh, middle income countries, because the patient usually presents at a later stage when the disease is already locally advanced, most of the patients will receive a uh, neoadjuvant radiation or chemotherapy and then will present for the surgery. And the most appropriate type of therapy for each patient is determined by the type and extent of the tumor. What are the treatment goals, which can either be curative intent or a palliative intent the age of the patient, the concomitant diseases, as well as the performance status of the patient. Now, the cancer chemotherapy can be given with two goals. One is the curative intent, where the goal is the eradication of the disease, where the chemotherapy is given in three phases, the induction, consolidation, and the maintenance phase. Or it can be given as a palliative chemotherapy, which is the aim of the treatment of palliative chemotherapy is just to improve the quality of life of the patient. Now, the chemotherapeutic drugs, they act via a drug receptor interaction that stimulates a cascade of catastrophic events which lead to apoptosis in the cancer cells. But these drug receptor interactions also occur in the normal organ systems of the body. Thus, there is a risk of systemic toxicity with every chemotherapeutic agent. 
and mostly these chemotherapeutic agents are combined together to increase the fractional cell kill in the cancer also to decrease the drug resistance and also the chemotherapeutic agents which have similar side effects are usually not combined for treating a patient so uh, coming to the types of chemotherapy so we, we basically have three types of chemotherapy the one is the neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, where uh, uh, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy is basically given before the uh, definitive surgical resection of the primary tumor metastasis or both and the aim of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is to improve the chance of complete resection or survival that is it will decrease the tumor bulk and will help the surgeon to uh, to accomplish complete resection of the tumor or it can reduce the need of a more complex procedure like a patient who might be needing a mastectomy uh, earlier with neoadjuvant chemotherapy can be opted for a lumpectomy then another is the adjuvant chemotherapy which is given after the tumor resection which is basically to reduce the risk of tumor recurrence and micrometastasis and is the palliative chemotherapy to improve the quality of life of the patient now how do we classify these chemotherapeutic agents basically these are classified as alkylating agents where the mechanism of action is that these agents form a covalent bond with the guanine of the dna and thus leads to inhibition of dna synthesis so basically these this will include cyclophosphamide uh, which is a nitrogen mustard and metal salts like cisplatin then we have anti metabolite drugs which will uh, which in which we have the anti folate drug methotrexate and pyrimidine analogs like 5 chlorouracil then we have some hormonal agents which includes tamoxifen steroids like prednisolone progesterone and androgens and then we have some natural products which basically includes the anti tumor antibiotics which includes bleomycin donorubicin mitomycin then we have mitotic inhibitors which uh, basically act as anti microtubule agents like vincristin and vinblastin and podophyllium derivative which inhibits the topoisomerase 2 enzyme which basically inhibits the relaxation of a supercoiled dna so that a dna repair will not occur and it includes etoposide and there are some miscellaneous agents like procarbazine and hydroxyurea now based on the mechanism of action you can divide chemotherapeutic agents as drugs which block the synthesis of dna rna like we i have already discussed it is methotrexate which acts at the level of purine synthesis uh, five fluorouracil which acts which inhibits thymidylate synthetase and blocks the dna synthesis and then we have actinomycin d which inhibits the rna synthesis or you can divide it as per the drugs which cause damage to the dna that is it basically includes the alkylating agents so cyclophosphamide and cisplatin which will form a covalent bond with the dna leading to inter and intra strand cross links in the dna therefore damaging the dna and in this also we have the anti tumor antibiotics like bleomycin and doxorubicin which cause dna uh, strand strand breaks then there are drugs which cause this damage to the spindle of the cells that is they act on the mitotic phase of the cell cycle where they inhibit the uh, formation of microtubules so this basically includes the vinca alkaloids that is vincristin vinblastin and taxins that is paclitaxel and docetaxel so this is how we uh, uh, classify the chemotherapeutic agents as per the class of the drugs or as per the mechanism of action of the drug now the common elective surgeries for which these patients will present will be breast surgeries esophageal gastric surgeries bowel resections ovarian surgery like crs and then we have for, for germ cell tumors they will present for retroperitoneal lymph node dissection orchidectomy and osteosarcomas for amputations so as uh, i've already discussed that these chemotherapeutic agent, uh, agents apart from having the action on the cancer cells will also affect the normal cells of the body so they will have systemic side effects which can affect any of the organ system of the body now we'll discuss the uh, effects of the various agents organ wise coming to the nervous system so the most common agents which have neurotoxic side effects are vincristin and cisplatin and out of these vincristin is the only drug which has a dose limiting neurotoxicity as its side effect and the side effects of vincristin can range from peripheral sensory neuropathy muscular pain cranial neuropathy seizures and bilateral vocal cord palsy whereas cisplatin causes peripheral sensory neuropathy it is basically in a glove stocking pattern 
and also can affect the air in the form of ototoxicity and vestibulopathy. The other drugs causing neurotoxicity are a high dose of methotrexate can cause encephalopathy, seizures, or transverse myelopathy. Paclitaxel and docetaxel, apart from causing peripheral neuropathy, can also lead to autonomic neuropathies, which is very much clinically significant to us. And a high dose of cytorabin can cause acute cerebellar syndrome. So what will be our anesthetic considerations in the patients who has received any neurotoxic chemotherapeutic drugs? So for these patients in the preoperative period, we should take a thorough history and do a complete neurological examination preoperatively. And it is absolute must for us to have a baseline documentation of any neurological deficit present in the patient. So regional anesthesia will be a relative contraindication in these patients. And if it is given, we should document the neurological deficits and we should always weigh the risk benefit ratio when we are deciding for regional anesthesia. And as some chemotherapeutic agents can affect the autonomic nervous system leading to autonomic neuropathy, these patients can have orthostatic hypotension, erectile dysfunction, constipation, difficulty in micturition, and bladder atony. And so care is required in these cases if we are planning GA. So a patient who, has, who is detected with autonomic neuropathy preoperatively, there can be extreme hemodynamic responses in these patients to laryngoscopy, intubation, surgical stress, and blood loss. And these patients can also have autonomic gastroparesis. So they'll be at increased risk of aspiration. Therefore, all the precautions which we can take, adequate fasting, prokinetics, and RSI should be done in these patients. If a patient is having a motor neuropathy because of any chemotherapeutic agent with related muscle wasting, and if we give scoline to these patients, it can lead to life-threatening hyperkalemia. And also, we should prevent any perioperative hypotension and hypoxia in these patients because these factors will lead to worsening of an already present neurological deficit. So this is the basics of uh, the effects of chemotherapeutic agents on the nervous system. Now coming to the next system, which is the respiratory system. Now the most common agent with pulmonary side effects of significance is gliomycin cyclophosphamide, nitrosoureas, mitomycin, busulfan, and methotrexate. Out of these, we'll separately discuss the effects of gliomycin. But the common pulmonary toxicities which are seen in these patients are in the form of either interstitial pneumonitis, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, bronchospasm, pleural effusions, or pulmonary fibrosis. Now, the symptoms in these patients can vary uh, widely. Like a patient can be asymptomatic, can have just asymptomatic decline of the PFT or DLCO, or the patient can prevent, uh, present with a mild cough or dyspnea, or the patient can present with a life threatening lung fibrosis with severe restriction on PFT and respiratory failure. So uh, it is very important to look for the differential diagnosis in case of pulmonary chemotoxicity because the differentials will have a very similar presentation as we can see in a drug, uh, uh, chemotherapeutic drug-related pulmonary toxicity. So we have to differentiate whether it is because of infection or it is a metastatic disease or it is the mass effect of the tumor or a pleural effusion or a pul pulmonary embolism. So we have to see for the differentials if a patient is presenting with cough dyspnea and respiratory failure. So uh, coming to the uh, individual effects of various chemotherapeutic agents. Now, bleomycin is the most uh, important drug affecting the respiratory system. Now the patient can have asymptomatic de deterioration of PFT, DLCO2, cuff dyspnea, chest pain, and crackles, or the patient can have chronic progressive interstitial fibrosis, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, and diffuse alveolar damage. The presentation usually varies from uh, e uh, this only, either a pneumonitis or a chronic pulmonary fibrosis, but methotrexate can also lead to formation of pleural effusions and cause pleuritis. And mitomycin C is known to cause thrombotic microangiopathy and can lead to acute respiratory failure. Now coming to bibliomycin. So bleomycin is basically used to treat germ cell tumors and Hodgkin's disease. And the range of pulmonary toxicity is, the incidence is around six to 10% in these patients. And usually it is seen that the bleomycin pulmonary toxicity occurs insidiously during the first six months of starting of the treatment. But 
if the patient uh, receives high inspired fractions of oxygen that provokes pulmonary toxicity and this risk is lifelong when the patient has received bleomycin so what happens is that high fractions of oxygen cause uh, the type 1 pneumocytes to be replaced by the type 2 pneumocytes and these type 2 pneumocytes will further if uh, change there will be metaplasia of these type 2 pneumocytes and they'll be changed to cuboidal epithelium and they will uh, then uh, they will uh, there will be uh, fibroblast coming to the lungs so they will increase the fibrosis of the lung tissue and this process leads to chronic fibrosis in these patients now the patient will usually present with fever dry cough breathlessness pleuritic chest pain pulmonary crackles and hypoxemia which will be seen 4 to 10 weeks after the therapy with bleomycin now it was uh, uh, the first study of case series of bleomycin uh, chemotoxicity it was uh, published in 1979 and uh, there was a series of five patients for testicular cancer who were operated and they have received preoperative bleomycin and they have received more than 40% uh, of FiO2 during the surgery and all of them have developed post-op ARDS and eventually there was a fatal pulmonary respiratory failure. And at that time, it was suggested that high FiO2s uh, lead to uh, increased pul uh, pulmonary toxicity in with bleomycin. And the clinical and pathological pictures were also uh, similar to the oxygen toxicity as seen in these patients uh, during the top scene. But later on, the same authors, they uh, conducted a case series on 12 patients where the preoperatively they have received bleomycin and then they find, found out that uh, uh, FiO2 of less than 30% was associated with minor post pulmonary complication and there was no mortality. But then there was another uh, case series published, uh, another study published by Donut at, uh, at L, and they have said that apart from oxygen therapy, it is also the amount of fluids which is given, that is, uh, there should be optimal fluid balance and the post-chemotherapy post FVC and the operative time of the patient uh, of the surgery. So these all factors are also determinant of bleomycin-induced pulmonary toxicity. So what are the risk factors for the patient developing this toxicity? It is old age, accumulative dose of more than 400 to 450 units. Already the patient has a poor pulmonary reserves before receiving bleomycin radiotherapy and concomitant administration of other anti-cancer drugs which also affects the respiratory system, uremia and high inspired oxygen concentrations. The patterns will vary from dose dependent interstitial pneumonitis progressing to fibrosis, acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis with peripheral eosinophilia which will resemble eosinophilic pneumonitis and acute chest pain syndrome or bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia or a pulmonary venoocclusive disease. Now, when we are uh, assessing this, this patient preoperatively, firstly, we need a meticulous history with details of the oncological therapy, uh, like what was the dose given, when was it last given, and the chronological relation between chemotherapy and pulmonary symptoms. That will help us to decide the, uh, this will also help us to decide for the di differential diagnosis of the pulmonary symptoms. Then is the severity of condition. Uh, we can assess it by uh, checking for the effort tolerance of the patient and grading the dyspnea of the patient at rest and during exercise. A very good quick surrogate bedside marker will be the breath holding time of the patient, where, uh, which will tell us about the vital capacity of the patient. For the systemic examination, we can use respiratory rate, use of accessory muscles of respiration and nasal clearing, Chest auscultation might be unre unremarkable or the patient can have crackles. And the serial review of pulmonary function tests and DLCO, which will be done during the chemotherapy, can help us to guide what is the present status of the patient. Radiologically, bleomycin-induced uh, pulmonary toxicity, the chest x-ray, there will be bilateral basilar reticular opac opacification with blunting of CP angles, fine nodular opacities, consolidation or honeycombing, and in HRCT chest, we'll see ground glass opacities in dependent locations, extensive reticular markings, organizing pneumonia with subpleural nodules which might mimic metastasis. Now, what will be the anesthetic considerations in these patients? So preoperatively, 
to decrease the risk of post op pulmonary complications we need a supervised pulmonary prehabilitation for these uh, prehabilitation program for these patients where steam inhalation respiratory muscle training deep breathing exercises incentive spirometry and smoking cessation will help to reduce the risk of post op pulmonary complications now intraoperatively restricting the oxygen Uh, levels uh, FiO2 levels, judicious fluid administration, lung protective ventilation, and adequate intraop as well as postop analgesia. So postoperatively, a good analgesia, early mobilization, and physiotherapy. So these are all the steps we can take to prevent postop pulmonary complications. Now, what is the guidance for oxygen therapy in these patients? Now, if a patient who has received a bleomycin and is hypoxic, it has been uh, stated that oxygen therapy should be minimized to maintain a saturation from eighty-eight to ninety-two percent, and high oxygen concentration should only be used with extreme caution for immediate life-saving indications only. Next, we move on to the cardiovascular system. so so the most common agent affecting the cardiovascular system are the anthracyclines then we have cyclophosphamide 5 fluorouracil bleomycin paclitaxel and docetaxel and the common toxicities vary from hypotension hypertension arrhythmias myocardial infarction congestive cardiac failure cardiomyopathy myocarditis pericarditis pericardial effusions and cardiac tamponade so what are the manifestations of cardiotoxicity uh, as per the agents anthracyclines which basically include doxorubicin epirubicin and donorubicin they cause acute and chronic decrease of the left ventricular ejection fraction that is they cause left ventricular systolic dysfunction then they can lead to heart failure and arrhythmias the alkylating agents like cyclophosphamide e phosphamide apart from causing lv dysfunction can cause pericarditis pericardial effusions and also can acutely prolong the qt interval my antimicrotypal agents like pacli and docetaxel are known to cause arrhythmias so they cause sinus bradycardias morbid uh, type 1 and 2 heart block complete heart block and also can cause ventricular ectopics Whereas antimicrotypal agents, when Christian, when Blastin, they cause hypertension and acute vascular events in the form of stroke, MI, or acute pulmonary edema. Now, monoclonal antibody trastuzumab, which is used in CA breast, can cause dyspnea, peripheral edema, LV dysfunction, and the risk of all this toxicity increases when it is combined with anthracyclines. Monoclonal antibodies like bevacizumab cause thromboembolic events. then we have tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib sorafenib which cause fluid retention ankle edema asymptomatic drop of lvf and qt prolongation and then we have selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen which causes qt prolongation and thromboembolic embolic events so basically uh, there is a uh, increased risk of lv dysfunction there can be thromboembolic embolic events there can be qt prolongation and there can be arrhythmias with various chemotherapeutic agents so this is uh, basically now i'm focusing on the anthracycline induced uh, cardiac toxicity so what are the risk factors in a patient which increases uh, the risk to have anthracycline induced cardiac toxicity is if the patient is already having a cardiac disease with lvef of already less than 50% or we are using a concurrent chemotherapy like trastuzumab which also causes lv dysfunction or the patient is in the extreme age group that is the age is either more than 65 or less than 4 years a female patient current or previous radiation therapy if the patient has received to the mediastinum and the patient has a history of hypertension smoking hyperlipidemia obesity or diabetes now how do we define this chemotherapy induced cardiotoxicity so definition range from development of heart failure symptoms to development of overt lv dysfunction and reduction in the ejection fraction on cardiac imaging so it was schwartz et al in 1987 who defined the cardiotoxicity due to anthracycline as either a absolute drop of 10% in the lvf that is if the uh, previous lvf was 50 now it is 40 or there is a decrease to below 50 in a patient with a baseline lvf of more than 50 or there is an absolute 10% drop in lvf or drop below 30 in a patient with baseline lvf less than 50 so if the lvf was already more than 50 and it drops below 50 or there is an absolute drop of 10% so 
or it was less than 50% previous to uh, before starting chemotherapy and now it has dropped to below 30%. So that is uh, chemotherapy induced cardiotoxicity uh, for anthracyclines. Now there was a paper published uh, uh, where they studied the influence of anthracycline therapy and cardiac function during anesthesia. And they stated that subtle abnormalities in myocardial function that become apparent only after exercise may exist in survivors of childhood cancer who had previously received anthracyclines yet have normal resting cardiac function. So they stated that abnormalities can also be seen in a patient who has a normal resting cardiac function. That is the patient is having a normal EF. And they stated with their study that they've studied uh, this in a 43 uh, patients, uh, children who have received anthracyclines. And they have uh, seen the changes in the trans thoracic and the trans esophageal echo postoperatively. And they stated that previous treatment with anthracycline may enhance the myocardial depressive effects of anesthetics, even if the patient is having normal resting cardiac function. So uh, how do these uh, drugs cause cardiotoxicity is they basically lead to the formation of free radicals. Uh, there is a formation of oxygen free radicals and then uh, there is decreased ATP production formation of some toxic metabolites which leads to myocardial uh, fiber fibrosis and thus leading to uh, impaired systolic function. Transtuzumab basically blocks the HER2 receptors in cardiac myocytes, and these signals are required for cardiac myocyte repair. That is, the myocyte is not able to repair itself, so that is why this is how it causes cardiotoxicity. Now, how do we monitor this cardiotoxicity? Now, a detailed clinical history, cardiac examination, and ECG is required in any patient before initiating anthracycline based uh, cardio uh, chemotherapy. And this is to be repeated every three months. So basically, uh, clinical history, examination in ECG before starting chemotherapy and repeated every three months. And a myocardial imaging by echocardiography should be done. A global radial or circumferential strain are uh, consistently abnormal, even in context of a normal LVEF. And ESMO, the European Society of Medical Oncology, they have advocated the use of troponin in routine monitoring of patients who are receiving anthracycline chemotherapy. And the use of troponins with transtuzumab is, is still less defined. BNP and anti-bro PNP to predict LV systolic dysfunction and they have mixed results and uh, the use is controversial. And the cardiac MRI studies can be done to look for myocardial fibrosis in these patients. Now imaging with monoclonal indium 111 antimyosin antibodies has been suggested where these antibodies bind to exposed myosin in necrosis cells. So basically the part which is necros, the necros myocardial cells will bind this monoclonal antibody. Therefore, if the patient has a diffuse uptake on the imaging, that will show that it is a very generalized process and that is anthracycline cardiomyopathy. A focal uptake will show a local pathology that is it is a myocardial infarct. So this is the ESMO guidelines, which were published in 2012 for how to assess a patient while they are undergoing anthracycline chemotherapy. So before starting a chemotherapy, baseline cardiological evaluation and ECO is done. So as they have recommended the use of troponins in the, to, to detect the uh, toxicity. So they suggest that troponin should be evaluated at each cycle. And if troponin uh, I comes out to be positive in any of the cycle, enalapril is started for one year. And ECO is recommended then at the end of chemotherapy at three, six, nine months, then 12 months. And then every six months for five years, because the troponin was positive, they have reduced the uh, monitoring period to six months for at least five years. And if the troponin levels were negative during each of the cycle, then ECO is recommended at 12 months and then every year. But if the troponin levels are not evaluated during the chemotherapy, anthracycline-based chemotherapy, they suggest that ECO should be done at the end of chemotherapy at three, six, and nine months, then at 12 months, and then every year. And if at any time point we detect a left ventricular dysfunction, the patient is usually started on A synaptors and beta blockers and then is uh, clinically followed up. Now, the treatment of cardiotoxicity will include ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, warfarin, and LMWH based on the pattern of cardiotoxicity seen. Coming to the anesthetic considerations, 
Now, patient who has received anthracyclines or any uh, chemotherapy with cardiotoxic effects, a thorough history, examination, ECG and 2D echo should be done. We should identify high-risk individuals preoperatively. So we should look for the effort tolerance of the patients. We can also get a CPET done post the new adjuvant chemotherapy, which will give us the levels of the VO2 max, that is maximum oxygen consumption and anaerobic threshold. And we know that a VO2 max of less than 15 ml per kg per minute and anaerobic threshold of less than 11 ml per kg per minute are associated with increased risk of post-op mor uh, morbidity. We can use the RCRI index of the ACC AHA guidelines along with ECO and CPET for risk assessment. An anti-pro BNP can be done to assess the patients who are at high risk of heart, heart failure in the post-operative period. Now, uh, we know that myocardial depressant effects of anesthetic drugs will be amplified in these patients. So invasive intraoperative monitoring by using arterial catheters, central venous pressure, transesophageal echo depending on the severity of LV systolic dysfunction and on the basis of the also what is the planned procedure. It is important to maintain normothermia in these patients because we know that hypothermia itself leads to increased cardiac complications postoperatively. And we should be vigilant about the drugs which prolong the QT interval because some of the chemotherapeutic agents are associated with long QT syndrome. So drugs like ondansetron, quinolones, amiodarone, fluconazole, salmetrol, which prolong the QT, we should be vigilant with these drugs. So algorithm for anesthetic management as per the cardiovascular point, uh, point of view. If a patient is scheduled for surgery with a previous chemotherapy and it is an emergency procedure, so we'll manage is it as high risk for heart failure and arrhythmias and shift to either recovery or ICU based on the condition. If it is not emergency, then we look for features of heart failure, systolic dysfunction or QT lengthening. And then we'll decide as uh, the management. Basically, we'll use invasive or non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring, avoid the use of myocardial uh, depressants. We'll maintain normothermia and we'll optimize the perioperative analgesia to prevent any complications. Next, we come to the gastrointestinal system. So the most common agents causing GI side effects are cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, 5 chlorouracil methotrexate, echinomycin D, and mithromycin. Basically, almost, almost all the chemotherapeutic agents are associated with increased risk of nausea, vomiting. There can be diarrhea or constipation. 5 fluorouracil is associated with uh, diarrhea, and then these changes can lead to uh, these symptoms can lead to dehydration in these patients. The patient can have weight loss uh, and electrolyte imbalance. So, cancer is already a chronic inflammatory state. We know that the patient goes from phases of pre-cachexia to cachexia. So, along with the with the side effects of chemotherapy, the patient will be mal, mal can be malnourished and can be dehydrated with various electrolyte imbalances. So uh, also the patient can uh, have mucositis uh, because of the effects of the chemotherapeutic agents leading to rhythma, inflammation, and ulceration of GIT, which will, and this mucositis is also exacerbated by poor nutritional status, trauma, oxygen therapy, and dehydration. So for anesthetic considerations, we should uh, look for the fluid and the electrolyte resuscitation before the surgery. RSI should be contemplated in the patients who are prone to vomiting. And if a patient is having mucositis, we should do the laryngoscopy very carefully as it can lead to bleeding and difficult airway visualization during the intubation. Now is the renal system. Now we know that the most common drug which causes side effects in the renal system is cisplatin. That is platin group of drugs, cisplatin. And carboplatin or xaliplatin are associated with less nephrotoxicity as compared to cisplatin. Then we have e-phosphamide, cyclophosphamide, and mitomycin C. The manifestations of renal toxicity will range from renal tubular and glomerular damage, hemorrhagic cystitis, which, which is seen with cyclophosphamide. There can be microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which can lead to renal failure, which is seen with mitomycin C. There can be syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH, which is caused by cyclophosphamide and vincristin, and there can be hyponatremia. So the most common drug we'll discuss is the cisplatin affecting the renal system. So how it affects the renal system is it causes coagulation necrosis of the proximal and the distal renal tubular cells and in the collecting ducts. So 
this will uh, and uh, apart from the coagulation necrosis it also decreases the renal blood flow and hence the gfr also it causes wasting of magnesium and potassium so a patient who has received a single dose of 2 mg per kg or 50 to 75 mg per meter square will have a nephrotoxicity will be seen in up to 30% of the patients which can present as a non oligouric aki because there is wasting of magnesium and potassium uh, via cisplatin it can lead to hypomagnesemia hypocalcemia and hypokalemia so how do we protect the renal system if the patient is getting cisplatin is we limit the dose we can use hydration uh, regimes which basically includes iv saline uh, and then we can add on with the potassium and magnesium because of the uh, magnesium potassium wasting occurring because of cisplatin now there are some renal protective agents which are used with cisplatin to decrease the risk of aki then we have amiphostin which is organic thiophosphate then we have sodium thiosulfate and n-acetylcysteine which can be used to prevent nephrotoxicity now anesthetic considerations for a patient who has received cisplatin uh, platin groups or other renal toxic groups uh, chemotherapeutic agencies will adequately assess the renal function of the patient preoperatively and will employ all the renal protective strategies in the perioperative period which will include fluid optimization with correction of any dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities we should carefully use all the nephrotoxic drugs uh, which basically will include the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs as well as amino glycosides next is the hepatic system now the most common agent with hepatic side effects is methotrexate 6 mercaptopurine cyclophosphamide and ls pogenes and the dds will include either a liver meds alcoholic liver disease infections or use of other hepatotoxic medications the changes can vary from fatty uh, liver to cholestasis cirrhosis fibrosis and hepatocellular necrosis the anesthetic considerations will be drug dose modification as per the lfts and regional anesthesia will have a relative contraindication if there is associated coagulopathy because of the effects on the liver last is the hematopoietic system we know that all almost all the cytotoxic drugs will affect the hematopoietic system and the, all the cell lineages are affected which includes neutrophils platelets and rbcs now with the decrease of uh, uh, hemoglobin levels there will be decrease oxygen carrying capacity neutropenia can lead to increased risk of infections and decreased platelet count increases the risk of hemorrhage so thorough assessment of bone marrow function preoperatively with use of broad spectrum antibiotics and all the aseptic precautions and keeping in mind the risk of coagulation disturbances because of the cancer cancer treatment that is the chemotherapeutic agents as well as immobilization now this was all about the chemotherapeutic agents now coming to the effects of rt radiotherapy on uh, perioperative implications of radiotherapy so how does radiotherapy works is radiotherapy damages the dna of the cancer cells normally uh, uh, a cell knows how to repair the dna but this uh, this uh, mechanism is absent in cancer cells so once the dna is damaged they will not be able to repair the dna and that will lead to the apoptosis of the cells the aim is uh, of the radiation therapy is to maximize the tumor control and improve the quality of life and to minimize the toxicity and preserve, preserve the other organ systems so basically there are three types of radiotherapy there is an external beam radiotherapy where the radiation source is outside the body in the form of radioactive substances like cobalt or there are linear accelerators and then is the brachytherapy where the source of radiation is kept either inside or close to the site of radiation and then there is a stereotactic radiotherapy brachytherapy is basically used for ca cervix uh, vulva or breast then we have uh, stereotactic radiotherapy where uh, a high dose of radiation is given in uh, less number of fractions by using a very high resolution imaging so the adverse effects of radiotherapy will be uh, based on the anatomic area where we are giving the radiation what is the sensitivity of that tissue that is receiving the radiation and the cumulative dose and dose per fraction of the radiation therapy the adverse effects will range from acute to late effects where in in the acute effects that is a normal tissue response 
and the acute effects will affect the cells which uh, uh, there will be loss of reproductive capacity of the cells so that is basically it will involve the tissues which have a rapid cell turnover that is the skin mucosa and the bone marrow whereas the late effects uh, will be seen after a considerable time of irradiation where there will be tissue fibrosis damaged vasculature and uh, obliterated lymphatics so system wise uh, the organ wise uh, how uh, the rt effects is in the skin acutely we can see erythema desquamation and ulceration whereas in late stages there will be atrophy fibrosis and telangiectasia git in the acute phase we can have mucositis diarrhea and gastritis whereas in the late phase we'll see again atrophy and fibrosis and necrosis in the nervous system high doses will lead to demyelination and later stages will lead to radiation induced necrosis in the lung during the initial 2 to 6 months there can be a phase of radiation pneumonitis which can progress on to lung fibrosis from the period of 6 months to years in the kidney the patient can present with hypertension protein urea because of the radiation nephropathy and in the cardiovascular system the patient can have pericarditis cardiomyopathy because of decreased ventricular ejection and conduction blocks can be seen even after 10 to 20 years of radiation therapy because of the fibrosis of the conduction pathways now the most important uh, anesthetic implications of radiation therapy to us will be the airway changes which will be seen after radiation therapy so uh, basically uh, the radiation therapy will affect each and every side of the airway and so uh, covering this each uh, side by side so coming to the face and buccal mucosa the disability which will occur in the early phase there will be either oral thrush or facial pain which can later on lead to formation of ulceration or cutaneous fistulas with purulent discharge which will make our back mass ventilation difficult then the radiation uh, therapy affecting the temporomandibular joint can lead to trismus in the these patients and this will lead to difficult laryngoscopy and intubation the tongue will be affected initially there will be inflammation and edema leading to glossitis and then glossomegaly which will falsely obscure our malum patti class and will lead to diffic difficult laryngoscopy the teeth will be affected early in the form of increased mobility and then leading to loss of teeth which will make our back mass ventilation difficult and there can be dislodgement of teeth during laryngoscopy the floor of mouth there will be decreased mobility of the tongue because of the tissue fibrosis and this will in turn make our laryngoscopy difficult the mandible there will be asymmetric dehiscence of mucosa and microgonadia leading to mandibular recession and fistula formation this leads to decreased mandibular space and difficult back mass ventilation in laryngoscopy the suprahyoid region initially will have edema and then will become a firm woody mass so there will be limited extension flexion and extension of the atlanto occipital joint and the lower airway will also be affected that is epiglottis and glottic edema edema can occur later on leading to symptoms like snoring hoarseness of voice and irritant cough all these changes can lead to difficulty in visualization of the larynx and thus difficult intubation now coming to the pulmonary effects of the radiation therapy now the radiation therapy to uh, near the area of the lung can lead to radiation induced lung injury which can vary uh, uh, in the initial period there will be radiation induced pneumonitis where there will be hyperemic congested mucosa initially there will be infiltration of the neutrophils uh, leading to inflammation there will be slowing of the cells of the lung uh, the endothelial cells which will lead to hyaline membrane formation and this will present as a period of radiation induced pneumonitis the patient might recover from this episode or then can progress to a period of radiation induced uh, fibrosis with the fibroblast will come into action and will, will lead to fibrosis of the lung tissue now the patients will usually present with symptoms of cough dyspnea fever and chest pain auscultation may be normal or there may be crackles the investigations which we can get are the chest x ray the ct which will show ground glass opacities pulmonary function test and diffusion uh, capacity of uh, carbon monoxide and resting saturation uh, which might be reduced now the cardiac effects of radiotherapy now this these effects will be seen for uh, when radiotherapy is used for thoracic malignancies 
and the risk increases with combined use of cardiotoxic chemotherapy. So if the patient has received RT for thoracic malignancy and has received a cardiotoxic chemotherapy, the effects will be, uh, the risk will of cardiac effects will increase. So adverse effects will basically include myocardial fibrosis, which can present as restrictive cardiomyopathy with diastolic dysfunction. There will be coronary artery disease, basically can be seen in patients with left breast cancer uh, who have received RT. There can be valvular heart disease or there can be fibrosis of the conduction pathways leading to various arrhythmias. So coming to the summary and the take-home message. So we have learned that chemotherapeutic drugs and radiotherapy can produce serious multi-system side effects which directly impinge on the patient's perioperative care. And it is our responsibility to be aware of all these side effects. Therefore, we should conduct a thorough preoperative assessment. A structured intra-op and post-op management plan should be individualized as per the patient. There should be a multi-systemic, multidisciplinary, individualistic approach to the patient. And a pre-assessment form which gathers all the cancer-specific treatment data will refine our patient care. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Dr. Kiran. That was a very comprehensive review of what chemotherapy and radiotherapy does to various systems and the implications for anesthesia. Thank you. Uh, on this note, I would also like to welcome Dr. Jotsna Goswami, our president. Uh, Dr. Sohan and Dr. Jotsna have joined us from Coimbatore, where they've gone for GAR. Uh, and uh, Dr. Rakesh could not join us because he's on the way. So, Dr. Jotsna, is there anything that you would like to uh, address? Yes. Us? Hello, hello everyone. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, nice presentation, Kirata Kiran. It was very good, comprehensive presentation. And uh, I think uh, this is the first uh, occasion, first webinar for our uh, webinars. Uh, we, what we are starting for the for weekly webinar we are starting. Uh, but year long we are planning to do it, and it will be very much effective for uh, useful for the students. A fellow who are doing the fellowship, the SOPC fellowship, as well as the, uh, they will start for FNB uh, on anesthesia. So um, all all the SOPC officials and uh, other people who are the members, they can they will participate as in the faculty. Uh, that is their plan. Dr. Anjali has nicely planning for the program, and I hope it will be very much helpful and useful for all of us. Uh, but it was today's presentation was very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiran. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I just wanted to say that ClearNet is going to give us a link. So if anybody has missed anything then, uh, or if somebody has been unable to attend, then you can refer to that link. We also have a link for the opioid sparing anesthesia webinar that we did. So I'll put that up in the group. Dr. Sohan, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so I just wanted to say because now we have started the SOPSI fellowship and already like um, this six hospitals are running. And so I invite all other who are interested to do this fellowship under SOPC so they can join their um, institution, whichever we have accredited until now. And we have also invite few hospitals if they are interested to like take this um, SOPC fellowship in their hospital. So they can apply online, they can email me on the, the SOPC email ID and so, so, so that we can send any team for the inspection and they can that this can be given to you. So uh, otherwise, uh, Kiran, your, your talk was really good. I appreciate it. And uh, anything else, um, Dr. Dr. Yosna? Yeah, uh, Anjali, should we take any courses, uh, any courses from the students uh, Dr. to Dr. Kiran? They can ask, people, they can ask them. At the moment, we don't really have anything in the chat box. I just okay. wanted to ask everyone whether anybody's actually encountered Herceptin related uh, cardiotoxicity. I think they have started using Herceptin, Trastuzumab. Any such cases? Mm. Kiran, anything that you have seen? Ma'am, I have not encountered yet any transfer. No, yeah. And Kiran, uh, like, is there any like uh, impact of uh, this current? Immunotherapy on like anesthesia because some patients are nowadays coming after the immunotherapy 
because yes. the, the, the yes, chemotherapy sir. are not working in immunotherapy which mm -hmm. are coming up in immunotherapy yes sir immunotherapy is coming up in the uh, for the treatment of various cancers and basically immunotherapy is associated with various endocrinopathies so mm -hmm. we need to get the t3 t4 tsh because it is affecting the hpa axis also so mm -hmm. we need to get the t3 t4 tsh and if we are suspecting any adrenal suppression we can get acth and cortisol levels in these patients so basically the effects uh, cardiopulmonary effects are there but then the basic uh, main effect of immunotherapy is on the endocrine system so the patients can also present with diabetes mellitus if they are uh, having uh, they are uh, been given uh, immunotherapies so uh, doctor so basically i have a high index is a small question undergone uh, uh, you know, bleomycin chemotherapy, these patients, when they are undergoing one lung ventilation, how do you manage them? What is the oxygen saturation you put? Generally, people go in with 100%, 80%, but what do you do when the patients already had bleomycin? We've already had seven, eight such patients, and I would like to know how you manage those patients. Uh, Ma'am, the recommended oxygen saturation levels to be maintained are 88 to 92%. So we'll uh, go for using PEEP or CPAP uh, then rather than increasing the FiO2 of the patient. So what FiO2 would you keep inside? Ma'am, basically patients? in closed circuit, we use around 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. So that suffices? Yes, ma'am. Right. Thank you. Okay, I think there was some problem with the, this clinic today. Otherwise, they are always good. There was some uh, there was many people they encountered yeah. some issues during uh, uh, this lecture. We have not received any questions still. Uh -huh. If you have, if we have any uh, received any questions, we will put it down in the chat box. Okay. Uh -huh. So on this note, if we do not wish to. Ask anything further. I think I would like to thank Dr. Kiran for an excellent presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Sohan and uh, Dr. Jotsna for making it in time for this uh, event, though they are both in Koyamitu. Thank you all for joining and we await your participation in the next event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Clinet, for your support always. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you all for everyone. sharing the valuable insights. We are more than grateful to have you in our platform. And I hope that uh, we can see you again at our platform very soon yes, for the next will, session. Will, now, now we will see you every week. Every week we can see you. <laughs> but with the audio, audio and video quality for many people are complaining today. Yeah, I, I so that you please there, there are some problems. I think today, otherwise I, I, I attended. Yeah, otherwise it is good. Many lectures in ICA yes. uh, always good, but there are some issues. Yeah, so today is maybe some first time, technical first problem. session today. Yeah, some uh -huh. issues was there. So mm -hmm. otherwise, it is very good. We'll see you Thank again you next so week. Next week. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's all our pleasure. With all your permission, we are signing off this session here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.